The final section in biology looks at life processes. We'll kick off with photosynthesis. Let's just remind ourselves about photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process where green plants make their own food using the energy from the sun in the presence of chlorophyll. Watch this next clip and see if you can write down the four components that are needed for photosynthesis. All green plants need sunlight to make their own food. The process is called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis happens in... They contain a special green pigment called chlorophyll, which traps sunlight. The leaf, in all its shapes and sizes, is actually a food factory. In photosynthesis, it takes raw materials from the environment and uses them with sunlight to produce sugar. This is the food it then uses to grow. Photosynthesis can be described by an equation. Carbon dioxide plus water with the sun's energy, produces oxygen and sugar. At nightfall, with no sunlight, plants can't photosynthesize. But as the sun rises, the food factories are back to work again. You should have come up with four things that are needed for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide and water, the raw ingredients sunlight which provides the energy and chlorophyll in the green leaves which acts as a for the reaction. These together make glucose, a simple sugar, and oxygen gas is also given off, a byproduct of the reaction but essential for life on this planet. See if you can write out the word equation for photosynthesis. So your word equation for photosynthesis should look like this. Carbon dioxide and water, in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll, produce glucose and oxygen. Now remember, photosynthesis doesn't just occur on land, but also in the water. In the next clip, what is Stella testing for and why? Uh oh Oxygen level down here is getting a bit low. At least my new plants will help me there. Green plants are vital in maintaining the oxygen level everywhere on Earth. Oxygen we all need to breathe. When plants photosynthesize, they use up carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. This is vital for all us animals on land and sea, including my goldfish carrot. Look closely at the pond weed. You see tiny bubbles of gas produced by the leaves. This test tube has been collecting gas for a few hours. Looks like oxygen to me. The pondweed has been photosynthesizing this time, taking in dissolved carbon dioxide and, in the presence of sunlight, producing glucose and that all-important oxygen as tiny gas bubbles. And if we do this, the fish tank is now in the dark. So without sunlight, photosynthesis will stop. Here are the key points you need to know about photosynthesis. <laughs> The ingredients for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll. The products are glucose, a simple sugar, and oxygen, essential for the planet. Can you still remember the word equation for photosynthesis? If not, you could rewind and go over this section again, or move on to the structure and function of the leaf. To make photosynthesis happen, you need these green leaves. These are the food factories, if you like, that produce glucose. Now, leaves are well adapted for photosynthesis. For a start, they have a large surface area, so they can absorb the maximum amount of sunlight. And if we look under a microscope, 
we can see that the leaf has many tiny holes all over the surface, which are called stomata. These are specialized structures that allow for the exchange of gases, carbon dioxide to pass in and oxygen to pass out during the day. Veins, which you can see here, carry water into the leaf from the roots. And if we go below the surface of the leaf, we can see the palisade cells, which are packed with chloroplasts. The chloroplasts contain the green pigment chlorophyll, which absorbs the sunlight and makes it available for the process of photosynthesis. Weren't sure of anything? Stop and go back. Or for a change, why not use the bite-sized book or try our unique online website? Remember, it's your choice. The third section in this unit looks at respiration. The one thing I am in short supply of now is energy. In fact, to do anything, I need a source of energy. And can you remember where we get our energy from? We get our energy from the food we have eaten by respiration, the process where a supply of oxygen releases energy from our food. Respiration is a chemical reaction which releases readily available energy for just about everything we do, including hard exercise. But sometimes it's important to know exactly how much energy is required and we need to be able to measure it. And white ball's coming up on the inside but there's only a short hair between Big Eek and they're coming into the final ball. Racehorses certainly look as though they're using a lot of energy when they're running a race. But just how much energy do they need? And how can they get it all from just a handful of hay? I know I'd need to eat a lot more than a handful of hay to make me run that fast. I'm with Christine Smy, who knows a lot about what horses need to eat. They need a tremendous amount of energy. We measure energy in kilojoules. Standing here, we'd be using around five kilojoules per minute. And if we were to run a three minute race, we'd be using 150 kilojoules. And that would be approximately the energy equivalent of this much beef burger. That's not much for beef burger. How much energy then would a racehorse need to use? A racehorse running a three minute race would require 65,000 kilojoules. Wow. And in order to gain that much energy, he would have to eat the equivalent of 17 beef burgers. A bucket full of beef, that's a huge amount of energy. But how can Arnie get that much energy from just eating hay? We can use a bomb calorimeter to measure just how much energy is stored in one gram of finely chopped hay. So one gram of hay contains eight kilojoules of energy. So for one race, Arnie would have to eat this much hay. But racehorses can't spend all their time eating. So most are also given food pellets, which are very high in carbohydrates. Watch. If we put one gram of finely chopped food pellets into the bomb calorimeter, we can see just how good an energy source they are. One gram of food pellets provides not eight, but 15 kilojoules of energy. After all this activity, we need this. The energy values of all foods, including biscuits, can be measured in terms of kilojoules, and we don't need a bomb calorimeter to measure it. Most food packets will say how many kilojoules there are in 100 grams. And here, this packet of biscuits has 2,032 kilojoules per 100 grams. And after I have digested the biscuit, it's then broken down into the simplest units, usually glucose, a simple sugar. So glucose and oxygen are the ingredients needed for respiration. And we can sum up the process of respiration in a word equation. Glucose reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water and energy. Why not stop the tape and practice writing it out until you know it off by heart? There are another couple of facts you really need to get straight respiration. First of all, respiration is often confused with breathing. It will help if you always try to remember that respiration is a chemical reaction that releases energy. Breathing is simply a physical process that birds and mammals like us use to take oxygen in using our lungs. 
Secondly, it's not obvious that respiration takes place in plants. You can't see them taking in oxygen. But the next clip looks at a rise in temperature to show that plants also respire. This experiment shows how plants release energy in respiration as heat. In this container is well-soaked germinating wheat. The other container is a control. It contains the same amount of water but is full of dead wheat. Look at the thermometers. The live wheat is a lot warmer than the dead wheat. Respiration is slowly releasing energy as heat. It's easy to think that because plants photosynthesize, they don't need to respire. Plants produce biomass, but they also do need to unlock the energy again for all the other processes, growing, reproducing, repairing damaged cells, and so on. In fact, the cells of every animal and plant respire, take in oxygen to release energy from glucose. So remember, plants both photosynthesize and respire. Respiration is a chemical process that is carried out in all living cells to release energy. Respiration is not the same as breathing, which is taking air into our lungs. And remember, plants both respire and photosynthesize. For the higher tier paper, the test questions sometimes ask you to apply your knowledge in a different context. So let's try one that does that. Here's a question from a past paper that looks at different levels of carbon dioxide. At first glance, the question looks complicated with lots of facts, so we'll go through it step by step. First of all, we're given a table which contains information about how hydrogen carbonate indicator solution changes colour in different amounts of dissolved carbon dioxide. If the colour of the indicator is reddish-orange, then it means that there's the same amount of carbon dioxide as in the air. Yellow means more carbon dioxide than in the air, and purple means less carbon dioxide than in the air. So that's the table of information we will need to answer the question. On the page is a picture of some test tubes. I've got some real test tubes, each containing hydrogen carbonate indicator. Test tube A contains small snails. Test tube B contains waterweed. C contains snails and waterweed. And D is the control with only the solution. And as we can see, at the start of the experiment, they are all reddish orange. From our chart, we know that this means that they contain the same amount of carbon dioxide as in the air. Now the question is, if we left these test tubes in the sunlight for two hours, what would the colour of the solution in each test tube become and why? And for this, we need to examine each test tube, think about what's inside it and go back to our chart to check what colour the indicator solution will have changed to. So here are test tubes with the hydrogen carbonate indicator. And how have they all changed after two hours? Well, in A, containing the small snails, the colour is yellow. There will be more carbon dioxide than in the air, as the snails will have been carrying out respiration. In B, containing the waterweed, the test tube colour is now purple, showing there is less carbon dioxide because the plant is photosynthesizing and using up the carbon dioxide. In C, containing plants and snails, the reddish-orange stays the same because of both respiration and photosynthesis, keeping the levels of carbon dioxide more or less equal. And D, the control, stays the same. So we have used the chart to work out our answers. If you weren't sure of any of them, why not run through the sections on photosynthesis and respiration again? Remember my equations for photosynthesis and respiration. I wrote them out on pieces of paper and put them in places like my bedroom and even in the bathroom. In biology, it's quite complicated. So use diagrams and flowcharts instead of writing and writing and writing. It helps you remember more. 
This brings us to the end of the biology section in this programme. Remember, the book and the website will help you with more practice questions. Also remember to pace yourself and do your revision in bite-sized chunks. So this would be a good place to take a break.